This is an exclusive excerpt from the Stuff File program with Peter Anthony Holder. Actor Jed Allen, who had a long and illustrious career as a daytime soap star, has died at the age of 84. Jed had been on Days of Our Lives, Santa Barbara, General Hospital, Love of Life, Secret Storm, and others. He also played Ian Ziering's father on Beverly Hills 90210 for five years. I had the great opportunity to talk to Jed back in February of 2005. At the time, he was promoting his book entitled Please Spell the Name Right, a memoir from a former young stud, now an old one. And he had recently taken over the role of Edward Quartermain on General Hospital. Here is a bit of that conversation now. You've uh, been doing daytime soaps for for a long time. Uh, you've been on Days of Our Lives, Santa Barbara, Port Charles, uh, currently on, on General Hospital. That's right. Um, your son on General Hospital is what, four years younger than you? No, he's the same age. He's the same age? <laughs> he's How does... the same age. He, he looks great or I look like crap. It's one or the other. It's, I can't be sure. But you, you, You've taken over the role of, of Edward Quartermain. Uh, was there any trepidation of taking a, a character that is clearly older than you are? No, because they, they, well, let me go back a little bit. In Santa Barbara, I took over something that was done by four actors in the first year of the show. They couldn't find the right one. So to change over, <clears throat> take it over, they give me the freedom to be what I want to be and do what I want to do. And since I was 10 years younger than the other guy who, who, took, who left the show to go to another show, um, his name was John Engel, the, the dear, uh, dear man and a fine actor, and... Uh, when they gave it to me, they said, "Do what you got to do." I mean, there's a there's a framework you got to stay within, but I can I I changed my it's my personality basically. Uh, I'm not that manipulative normally, but <laughs> you try to you try to change you try to color everything you do anyway. You try to make it where it's never one dimensional; it's always two or three or four dimensions. And you try to find different layers of things in soap opera. The more things you can put into a soap opera character, the longer you last. If you make everything black and white, you'll be off the show in short time. We've had an opportunity to talk to many soap stars on this program, and the thing I'm always, um, I've always marveled at is, is it, it is some of the hardest work in in television, in acting generally, because it's it's lots of dialogue, new dialogue every day. It's new dialogue and it's new emotions every day. That's that's the toughest part. The emotions, the dialogue is is secondary. That comes with at the second nature, but the emotions you have to come up with on the call. I mean, you walk in and you're doing three scenes, you're doing them. Three times, five scenes, let's say. You're doing them three times a piece. That's all you do them. And you've got to have the goods ready for them at, at, the, at the tip of your tip of your tongue, literally, and uh, and tip of your brain, too. How long does it take a, a character, like the one you're playing now, Edward Quartermain, how long does it take uh, for a character to become yours? <sighs> it depends how busy you are, Peter. It, it, uh, I started the show being very busy, and, and, and they did a lot of, wonderful things. Uh, it's not as busy as it was. They like to work the younger people more than they do the older people. It's, it's the way the uh, demographics read and what they want. So uh, it, it's not as busy as it was, but I, I call it my own now. I pretty much made it what, what I feel I want it to be. Um, I, I'm not saying that they'll ever forget John or even David Lewis, who was before John, uh, started the, the character. So there's 35 years of, of acting between those two guys. Uh, well, not quite 35, maybe 25, mm -hmm. and I'm the set guy to do it. The show has been on a long, long time, but, but those guys have been on with, I think, 30 years together. What made you put out this book at this time? Uh, it goes back about four years ago. I was uh, doing a walk at Texas Ranger down in Dallas, and I met a lot of young kids on the show. They were just uh, in the show, but some playing young heavies, some playing uh, the uh, ingenues and the young leading men. And we used to go out to dinner all the time, and I was kind of the older guy on the show. I was the bad guy, the lead, the lead heavy, the guest star on the show. And uh, we used to talk, and I used to tell stories and jokes and, and things, and try to, you know, just, I don't know, it made them feel good. And I was having a good time. I, I like being younger, younger people like that. It makes, you know, I think of my kids all the time. And, they, and they, one of the guys in particular, a young man named Colin Douglas, said, uh, came, to, came to California two years later and said to me, you ought to write a book. I said, who's going to read it? I said, I'm only a soap opera person. Most people don't know that. I don't know what... I said, but you got all kinds of stories. I'm telling you, I know guys who want to write for you. I said, how would you know a writer? He says, I do. I said, in fact, I want to call him for you, let him call you. And sure enough, this guy calls me, a young man named Rusty Fisher, who's 37 years old, who I've never met. And he said, I am a fan of yours for 25 years. 
but 20 years, he said, 20 years. Since I was about 20, uh, about 15 years old, I was watching soap opera with my folks. And I'm 37 now, something like that. I think, yeah, about 20, that's about right. And um, he said, I really want to write the story for you. Let, let me help you do it. We'll write it together. We'll do this, we'll do that. You dictate, I'll fix, I'll fix, you dictate, that kind of a thing. And then I started writing a Stream of Conscious, and he started saying, you can leave it alone, don't touch it, I'll fix it, and put it the, the right kind of chapters and sub-chapters, let me handle that portion. And uh, we, wrote, we put something together, which I think reads very well. It's quick, it's funny, it's, it's enlightening, it's touching, it's, uh, it's funny, it's, it, it tells a few things about people that uh, I normally wouldn't have said if they were alive because I don't want to hurt people. I'm not a tell-all person, but some of them deserve to be hurt, to be honest with you, <laughs> and some don't. So, you, you know, you, you, you stay with the good guys. Most of the people I've ever met have been wonderful performers, wonderful people to deal with. I rarely had a problem uh, with anybody except the ones I named or put in the book and he disguised the name. A couple of months ago, there was, an, uh, was it two months ago, maybe a month and a half ago, there was a great article on you in Soap Opera Weekly magazine, I believe it was. Mm -hmm. And you, you talked about your, your private life, you talked about your personal life and the loss that you had recently. Yeah. And uh, was, was that difficult to, to do? to talk about i mean you, you uh, actors are used to hiding behind a role and here you are talking about what's what's taking place in your life well it took place a couple of years back but what happened was my wife passed away about three years ago and uh, we were married 43 years so we had a marvelous relationship and uh, i love it dearly i still have difficulty talking about it mm -hmm. but when we did the show about the wife dying on the show i don't know if you know this uh the woman who played the other guy's wife was 91 years old Naturally, she couldn't be my wife anyway because I'm so much younger. But the point being is that the, the woman who passed away, she's a wonderful lady named Anna Lee. Right. And she passed away. And they wrote the show about the passing. And my, it happened basically the same way that it happened with my wife in the middle of the night. And, she, and I woke up in the morning and my wife basically passed away in my arms. But the, the thing of it all was that week was the third anniversary of her death. The day that I shot that show was the third anniversary of her death. But I had to come out and say, my wife just died. Now, if that doesn't tear you up, I don't know. So basically, I was pretty rough, pretty roughed up that day. And, it was a, and the, the writers, I understand, were, were not aware of that fact at the time. I had no idea. No. Nobody knew anything until way after, at least a day or two after. When we finally did the uh, memorial service, which was the end of the week, and it was also difficult, but not nearly as much as the day that she passed away. And uh, I tell you something, the reason Stanislavski became what he was was for exactly that situation, because uh, it was easy to remember. It was only three years, and it all came back to me, and it, it made it a very difficult day in between scenes, of course, but we got through it, and it became a very good show. And uh, as I said, it's still tough to talk about it. Going through your... your um I guess your resume. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, you've been on television for quite a few years uh, in, in long-running characters that you've played on, on daytime soaps, but I, I think a lot of people would also know that you, you're probably one of the hardest-working guest stars. I mean, if there's a tele what television show have you not been on over the years I guess as a guest star? Uh, probably, I don't know, everything, I guess, through the years. Uh, people forget that I was on Broadway in New York for 10 years. I was born in New York City. Mm -hmm. I did uh, five or six Broadway shows before I even came to California. And uh, that was my true love, uh, above anything else. And uh, probably getting on soap opera was just the luck of the draw. You have family, you have children, and uh, a job comes along, you take it, and uh, you, you run with that for the, at the, the particular time, and then I got a Broadway show. This was all live television, by the way, back then in the uh, 60s. Right. And live uh, soap opera. We, I was doing a Broadway show at the same time. So it was interesting. Life was good then and wonderful. And still, it was good my whole career, basically. But you get stuck in that milieu and that medium. And uh, they, they think that's, as I say in the book, uh, he's not nighttime, he's daytime. That's what they used to tell me. Until I had a, I really forced my way through the situation and got through to nighttime. But they wouldn't let me in for a long time because of the fact you're on daytime. There's a, there was a bias many years ago. Uh, that's kind of gone with the wind, thank God. But it was. Now, you mentioned you did uh, live soap operas. I guess that would have been, uh, what, was, this, was the Secret Storm one of the ones Secret you did? Secret Storm and Love of Life was live. Right. Yeah. In, back in New York. Yeah, that's, I used to, 
And I used to finish the show and call up my wife and say, how'd you like it? Can't do that anymore. <laughs> I mean, you, you got to wait eight, uh, two weeks if you get you even on the air, you know, two weeks later. But uh, we used to call her right away and say, hey, honey, what'd you think? She said, oh, that was great. Well, was, hey, you missed something there. You said the wrong name. Uh, you know, those things, what terrible things happen on live television. You know that. Mm-hmm. I mean, you, you marry, you, you call the girl your wife's name sometimes. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you do those things. I remember doing that when I got married. <laughs> I take the Toby to be my wife. I was, you know, it was wild. Wild times. Well, well, now, at the time, and, and again, this is the days in New York, you were, you're doing Broadway, you're mm-hmm. also, and you, you would do a, a soap in the daytime. So in the daytime, they took they knocked me off on Wednesday so I could do the matinee of the show, and that's how I, my life was going. Uh, two, three days a week on the show during the day, and a matinee show in the evening, and an evening show, you know, uh, for the Broadway show. Now, to me, that sounds like some of the hardest work in the world. I mean, you're in a situation where you're learning your lines for your Broadway play, and I'm sure you, you get that down, Pat, because that, to a certain degree, does not change. But the dialogue you're doing each and every day and your other character changes, does it, does it ever become a problem when you're in a situation doing a Broadway show at night and a, and a soap in the daytime live? It really, it really doesn't, Peter, I swear to God. Really? Yeah, people think it, it, it's, you know, if you're an actor, you, you can cut it off. You cut off one thing, you, you pick up another. And also, if you're doing it for a while, you know the character so well, the daytime character. You also know the thing you're doing in the play very well. The only thing you do in a play is every when you... When you have something live like that, when I say live with an immediate audience, you know what the audience reaction is. You go home and you say, why did they laugh then? Or why did they laugh then? They didn't laugh the night before. How did I get them to scream and cry that well when I did get them to do that the night before? You know, you do that kind of a thing. Every night, the run of a show. Right. Because I did. He used to drive me crazy. That used to drive me nuts. But never doing this both shows. That wasn't a problem. It wasn't a problem at all. In fact, you know, you thrive in that kind of work. You know, you're never not busy. It's wonderful. Now, what about the downtimes? Because that's one of the things that actors always concern themselves with. Uh, you, ne- you know, you, you, you're so busy, and then you're wondering if you're going to get a break. And then when you get a break, you're wondering if you're going to get busy again. The only real downtime, i be honest with you, I ever had was after Santa Barbara closed. I thought I'd have everything in the world right on my palm. I was still a fairly young man, and I thought I'd have another show right away. And uh, I didn't get a work job for almost two and a half years to speak of. I mean, I got a, uh, an episodic show, walked on, you know, doing a guest starring thing, but... I didn't have anything steady for about two and a half years. Then I got 90210, and I played Russ Sanders in 90210 for five years. Right. That's uh, Steve's father. Mm-hmm. That, was, that was a great joy. That was fun. Those kids were great. Is there anything in your long career that you, you've wanted to do that you haven't had the chance to do? Yes. I, I have never, believe it or not, done... I've done nightclubs. I've done singing. I've done singing on Broadway. I danced on Broadway. I've, I've never done a comedy sitcom on a running basis. And I've done comedy all my life, but nobody ever knew I did. I did it all on Broadway, most of it. But every time I came here, I was always a bad guy or the, the love interest or something like that. I could be funny. I was funny at times. I, on 9 or 2, I was funny at times. But overall, I, I can be a very funny man. I never got the chance to do a, a sitcom at night, which I would love to do, because I like the situation. It's four days rehearsal. You do two shows, and that's, that's your week. And it's a lovely situation. You don't have to be up 5.30 in the morning like film you do, you know. You get up at 10, you're there at 10 o'clock in the morning, you work till, till 5, you shoot your show on the weekend with a live audience, and it's wonderful. Wonderful. That's what I miss. That's my next thing that I really want to do. When you think back to the beginning of your career and what, what your hopes and aspirations were when you started, has, have you basically had the, the kind of... Not career? even close, if that's what you could ask me. <laughs> really? Not even close, no. <laughs> what, what did you envision your career would have been when I you started? I was going to be a movie star. That's what we all envision. Nobody says I'm going to be just a television personality or, or a television actor or a soap opera actor. They say, hey, I'm going for the big time. And, but life is dictate, dictated to you by certain situations, like children and marriage, like I mentioned before. You mm-hmm. just can't walk away and say, yeah, i got other things to do. I can't, I can't do this thing anymore. I can't support you. I don't want to do this job anymore. I've got to, you can't do that. You've got to stay with what you've got. And uh, it'll bring better things or it'll bring the same thing. In my situation, it brought a little of everything. So it was okay. But not what I really set out to do. Well, you know, the, the career you've had uh, to date, and it's still going strong, not that bad. Not that uh, bad at all. Very I impressive. I haven't got any complaints, Peter, whatsoever right now. i got to tell you. I, I am truly, I can't say content because I'm, I'm, I'm missing that one thing in my life, of course. But uh, I'm, I'm, I'm getting there. I'm better. Mm-hmm. And it gets better every day. That was actor Jed Allen, who passed away on March 9th, just eight days after his 84th birthday. His book, if you still want to read it, is available on Amazon. It's called Please Spell the Name Right, a memoir from a former young stud, now an old one. 
You can go to thestuffile.com, check out the show number for this program, which is show number 0500, and you'll find the link to either Amazon.com or Amazon.ca where you can order his book. And Stuff File program fans, you can hear the full version of this conversation by going to our Patreon page and becoming one of the select patrons of the show. In the longer version, Jed goes into greater detail about his 50-year career and shares his family's reaction to his book and more. Just go to patreon.com slash the Stuff File Program. You've just heard an exclusive excerpt from the Stuff File Program with Peter Anthony Holder. To hear any or all of the full hour-long shows, visit thestufffile.com. Stuff is spelled S-T-U-P-H. That's thestufffile.com. A presentation of Flying Fish Communications.